Today's project is about making a lid with a finial, but I really want to get into making finials. So we'll call this finials for dummies <laughs> because it's a dummy who's going to be teaching you about how to make the finial. But as you can see, finials are beautiful little thin thingies that go on the top of stuff and they're delicate and they look good. This one has a weird little bend in it and that's because I actually broke it while I was turning it, glued it back together and it made a very interesting shape. So later on I might try to do that on purpose but for this show probably not. But as you can see over here finials come in all shapes, sizes, forms and everything and it's really interesting on the shapes that you can make and the designs and the different woods you can use. These are some Christmas ornaments that we made a long time ago for PBS and you can see the shape and how it looks. Over here we made, a, we actually have a DVD on making this ornament. It's several different projects in one and kind of went finial crazy on it. I think I proved how many finials you can put on one project so yeah I kind of like the one on the left just a little bit better. <laughs> it has fewer finials. But that's all maple but if you come down to here on the Banksia pods you can see I'm using ebony and ebony is my favorite wood for making a finial because it's very strong, it's very sturdy, it's glossy and looks classy. And if you look at this project I made a while back, it's also, you look how thin you can go with this. I mean, that is narrow. So if you've got the right piece of wood, you also see there's a little captive ring on there. It's <laughs> just showing off. <laughs> but anyway, I love using ebony just for that fact that you can make very delicate finials. And the finial we're going to make today is actually going to be the one to replace this finial because it does have that little bend in it. I'd like to go ahead and make a better one, but we're going to make this in a couple parts. Let's put it that way. So I actually in practice made another finial which looks really nice, but it's going to be the finial for this box. So we're going to make a lid for this box here. And then what I'm going to do is actually make a finial to go back into this lid for the other, uh, then it'll make it be a box into the other wing bolt. Now, what wood are we going to use for the project other than ebony for the finial? We are going to use maple burl for the cap. And this is really cool stuff. And some of it has voids in it and things like that. And I love that because if you have a defect in the lid, you actually see the beauty of the wood through the ugly. And that's one of my favorite things is using ugly wood. Probably because it matches the look of the wood turner. <clears throat> anyway, I've drawn an X on both ends. You can see right there. And I'm using those to help me center right there on that point. I'm going to bring this point up and I add in from up here. Yeah, it looks pretty good actually. Lock that in and now there we go. I actually have a little bitty tool rest on here today. Uh, Robust makes a bunch of different tool rests for their lays and you used to haven't seen a real big deep one on here. This one's shallow because when we start turning the finial there'll be times where I want to take my hand and put it underneath there and put my finger on the back side of the ebony. So this is shallow enough I can do that. The thicker handles I couldn't reach around. And the reason I want to do that is it gives me some stability while I'm turning because it's such a thin and delicate object. So let's put that in here. Get this at about mid-level height and I'm talking just a little bit below the center of this spindle right there. Raise it up a bit more. Now I'm just going to turn this by hand. Let's just unlock that. And it's not hitting so we're good there. Going to take that, put my eyes on and grab my roughing gouge. And we'll turn this on. Slow enough speed here. And one thing I'm going to do for a bit at home, I'm going to tilt that just a bit so you can see the tool cutting I'm going to do. There we go. If I put the camera into the wood, it's a bad thing. Yeah, hurt your fingers too. So anyway, to start this cut, I'm going to have the tool rest tool really low at my hip. And then up here, I'm going to touch the bevel. See, it's not cutting there. And then, it's right there not cutting. I'm going to raise the handle. You see the cut happen. And then I can go across. So I'll do it again. And I go across. Now one thing that's different about this tool rest is it's not deep enough for me to put my finger under there to actually use it as a stop gap. So I've got to bring my hand underneath, but for right now it's not a big deal because all I want to do is round this out. And once we have it rounded out, then we're going to put a tendon on it for our chuck. Now that we're rounded out, we're going to put the tendon on and you've seen me use this before. It's my bedan, or actually an old parting tool, a thick one, that I put an angle on here and then I also cut away the side here to give me a little bit of relief so that doesn't hit the side of the wood. I cut up here. And the reason I do this is because the tenons I need to make have to have a dovetail or 
that angle right there to actually made up in the jaws of the chuck I'm using. It gives you the most secure hole. Hold. <laughs> anyway, I want to show you something on this is a little different here. And let's see, turn that off. I move this back. I want to put this up a little more right on center height because it's a scraping cut that I use and I have to have the tool back a little bit so I can get some reach. And I need to make this tenon about two. I got it written on, <laughs> quit that. I got it written on my chuck over here. Two and three eighths inch. That's how I keep track of this stuff. But anyway, I can eye that in pretty good. But I'm just going into a little cut and not take a lot of wood at once. If I went into the whole thing at once, it'd be too big of a hit and the tool might get a catch. Anyway, I'm going in and that looks pretty good. And I only need to make this about a quarter of an inch long on the tenon. And I'm angling up and in and that way right here, that will be the part that touches on the outside of the jaws. But I wanted to show you something that I don't think I've shown you before. That looks like the right angle. I'm going to grab my bowl gouge. There are a lot of people who use their bowl gouge, and you can see right here, they come in, push in, and make the tenon. Well, look at the angle or the cut on the grind there. See the curve in that? If I do this, the highest point is going to be the intersection between these two pieces of wood in there. So in other words, that's where it'll touch on the chuck jaws. If I can't quite get the shape I want, so I'm not going to be able to get the tin in here without scooping this out and making contact there. So when I use this tool right here, you can see how it makes a perfect fit. Like so for a chuck jaw. Matter of fact, I'm going to clean that up a little bit. <laughs> there we go. That looks good, and that's exactly how the jaws will come in and fit and mesh really tight. As you can see, we have our blank now mounted in the chuck, and it's holding really well. The shape I want to make for the lid is a continuation of this shape. So I want it to look like this weird shape is continuing in the same weird method up on top. Well, you'd think you'd come in here and measure this part to get the width that you need for the blank. Well, no. Think about it. We're talking about seeing this go through. So we want to kind of come out here and get that idea of what that shape is. And then think about this. We have that much thickness to go through. So I'm going to take the jaws and move them in just a bit more. And now I'll have what will look like a seamless ball going through this wood. Or kind of a ball with no air in it. So I'm going to lock that down. And just for grins, I'll take it to my calipers right here. And you can see, woohoo, I'm almost to the perfect dimension. So all I'm going to do is trim up this bottom first and just smooth this side out. Get my eyeballs on here. Turn the lathe on. We can pick up the speed a bit. I got a cricket in my shop. I'm not sure what I did, but something's jiggling around here. And I loosened something. I haven't figured out what I'm supposed to tighten back up again. But I will get to it. <laughs> anyway, we'll bring the parting tool in low make contact and I'm going to ride the bevel. You can see how this is riding right on the edge as I push it in. And Brian, you might be able to see this better than the other camera can. See how I've got the angle of the tool and it comes in just like that and I'm pushing and see how a tool rides and pushes down. That's how you do a parting cut or a cleaning cut. So you don't push it straight in, you ride it on the wood as it goes down. So there's a good bottom on that. So let's switch tools now. And ideally, I probably want to go with, yeah, that's a little sharp. I'm going to go with a um, spindle gouge with a regular grind. You can see that that is just a little rounded grind. It's not too pointy. And I'm going to come in here almost like I would do a roughing cut and just come across and I'm cleaning up the wood. There's a little bitty flat spot in there. And once I get that done, I'm probably going to be really close to that diameter that I need. And we can just check that occasionally, just bring this up and look at it. Yeah, we're pretty much right on. So, I want to go ahead and shape this just a little bit. And children, look the other way. I'm going to raise this tool rest up just a bit. There we go. Okay. <laughs> going to start turning in this way. And I'm just making one big old bead. And what I love about the maple is it turns so easily, so beautifully. I mean, it is a joy to use this wood. Now one thing, aesthetically, as I'm looking at this, I don't want a flat side like I have now because if you look at this, you can see I'm going to need to be curving as I come up out of the top. So the lid's going to look a little weird compared to a lot of lids you'd see, but that's the look I need to make this look seamless. So we'll come in here like here. And I'm not doing the finished turn on it yet. I'm just getting an idea. 
Now as I make this cut here, I have my thumb up here really tight to keep it from kicking back because that's a skate. That's a big skate. So that's what happens when you don't have it right and you push it in. So you want to bring the tool like this. It starts to cut. You rotate it open and it works. So you take the cut, the point's going in, and now you rotate it open. So you don't want to come up here because you've got a, a broad edge touching the wood and it wants to run across like so. So anyway, the next thing we want to do is we're going to start establishing a little bit of a lip to go down in there so the lid will sit right. Now we're ready to do the lip, but one measurement I do need now is I gotta loosen this whole thingy. Bring this in. I want to get the inside diameter of here because this is where the uh, lip is going to go in on this lid, right? So that looks good. And I want it to fit tight, so it's going to take a little bit to track down the size. <laughs> it's just a gauge. You think I could work it, right? Okay, so this is it. I don't know. It's a two and something, whatever. I'm not giving you any measurements on this because whatever system you're using is going to be different and a different size. So I'm going to turn this on. I've got one of these points dulled off. That point's dull. This point is sharp. So I'm going to bring this up here. Make a mark. And you see how that matches up on this side now? That is the exact diameter I need to make this lip to go in there. Well, I have to take away some of this outside now to make the lip. So we'll come back here. I'm going to very carefully, and I'm using my whole hand as a, as a brake right here to bring this in. I'm going to use the spindle gouge, and I'm going to go in straight, and then I'll rotate it once it starts cutting. A little more wood than that. There we go. And I'm sneaking up on that mark. I don't want to get right to that mark. And that's as far as I want to go because it's going to be fitting it. I want to make sure it fits right. So what do I want to grab here? Oh, got behind me. I'm going to grab my skew. Now I'm not exactly on center, but I think I can get away with it for right now. We'll just do a push straight in. There we go. And we made a lift. And the only reason I'm taking off a little bit of wood is if I screw up, I got more wood to play with when I'm done here. So we'll slide this out of the way. Bring this up here and see if it fits. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> I hit it on the first try. <laughs> that never happens. So cool. We're moving on to the next step already. I'm going to make this lip a little bit larger and then we're going to start hollowing it out. So let's get this in place. Turn her back on. Come back in with this tool. Now this lip I'm making right here, I want to make sure that it goes in a little bit too so the outer edge of the lid sits and meets on the outer edge down here. You want to meet on the edge, if you have it meet right here at this lip, it's going to raise up and you'll see a gap between the lid and the surface here. So, just very carefully come in again, make another cut. You could use any tool you want to do this. I mean, you could use a bowl gouge, you could use uh, a parting tool, but I don't like using a parting tool because it tears the grain out of it. This is a nice slicing cut once it gets going and so it doesn't tear the grain. This is an area that I do not want to be sanding in because once you start sanding you start hitting your tenon and you reduce the diameter of the tenon and so it doesn't fit as well. So anything I can make really clean cut right here I'll touch with maybe 400 grit sandpaper and I'm off to the races. So I will come now in with my skew again and I'm going to make sure that edge is straight all the way to the back and I should probably raise this up just a little bit to be on center so like I said I think I can get away with it and then right here where it meets I'm going to roll the tool do a really fine scrape all the way across there we go that looks good now we're going to hollow a little bit so we're going to attack this with our easy wood tool with the number one little carbide on there. I love this little tiny carbide because it does a great job of hollowing. You'd think the smaller the carbide, the less aggressive it would be. Now this sucker will fly. Matter of fact, we'll have this thing hollowed out probably in about 30 seconds. You can start the clock now. I'm right on center, so I'm just going to push in. And you can see the nice shavings it takes. And the lip I want to leave on our lip is going to be about that wide. One thing I want to show you, when you're aggressive with a carbide tool like this and you're working on a piece of wood as porous as this, it might be a little tough to see, but we'll see how it looks. There, you can see you're getting torn grain and stuff. You can see how the edge is even tearing there because I'm going to use a skew to clean that up possibly, but 
I've got torn grain there. When you get grain that, that is torn that deeply, it takes a long time to sand out, right? Well, I'll show you a trick with this. We'll go to the final, almost final depth that I want here. And this doesn't have to be horribly deep because this lid's gonna be kind of shallow. And we gotta drill a hole for a uh, tenon for a finial in a second anyway. So anyway, this is the trick. I'm going to start backing off on my pressure and taking lighter and lighter cuts. And this is not the complete trick though. Because now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this, so you can see this, I'm going to turn this on a 45 degree angle and not score the wood like I just did, and bring it back, and now you're taking even finer cuts. So by doing this angle, it's a shearing cut on the wood, you're presenting less tool to the wood, and at such an angle, it slices rather than scrapes. Now I don't think we're all the way down that we need to be, let me show you this though. Ah, look, that surface is looking 100% better. I, one more pass and I'll be sanding it at 2.30. So anyway, that's how you hollow this out using one of these tools. Next thing you want to do is shape the top and take it off and I'm going to show you the way we're going to finish the top once we've taken the top of the top off of the top. Yeah. So what I've been working on for a few minutes now is what we'll call a jam fit chuck. And you can see I went ahead and parted off the lid. It was sitting like that on the lay. That made the shape I needed. And I just need to clean it up a bit. I've sanded the inside already. But what a jam fit chuck is, lid, jam fit chuck, yeah, there you go, is something you can put this in and jam fit it. <laughs> I know it sounds kind of self-explanatory, right? But, oops, went the wrong way. Yeah, it's never perfect. Use that. I try to make the recesses shallow enough that when I put this on, the edges don't touch. And so I'm a little bit off here with it. I'm just trying to get her centered right. But once I get this jammed in there, the cool thing is it will hold it really well while I come back now. And I'm just going to turn that little nub off. So we'll come here and I'm going to use my spindle gouge. We'll lower that down. Turn this on. A little wonky, but that's okay. And when you do this cut, you push into it so the tool is actually helping hold it on. So I'm going to do this cut, and once this is rounded, I'm just going to make or sand it just a little bit. And you've seen that before, so I'm not going to bore you with it. And then we're going to move on to having some fun with a finial. Now I went ahead and took my blank, my ebony blank, and turned it down to a cylinder. And you'll see I have a tenon on this end, but not a dovetail because I don't have any dovetail jaws, I don't think anybody does, that are small enough to hold this. So what you do is the inside of this chuck has a hole through it, so you can literally pass this tenon into there. And since I made a cylinder, it's going to grip on all points. So once I find my stupid, there it is, <laughs> my wrench to tighten it, I'm going to lightly tighten that. Then over here, take that out, I'm going to then advance the quill and put that point right in the hole that I had there before because all I'm doing is centering it up because now I'm going to come back over to here and just crush the bejesus out of this so I have a good tight hold. So once I have a hold like that we can actually start turning on the ebony but I want to show you something we're going to use in the process of this. Right now I have a live center here in here, a standard one. But this came from one of my friends at rubberchucky.com. <laughs> Great name, I didn't make it up. These are finial, uh, I don't know what you call them, live centers basically. These don't spin, this is all solid. It goes into your tailstock, but those things right in there are ball bearings, so they rotate. So let me see, let me, you think I would've had one handy. Let me grab one over here, do the limbo. <laughs> so this, will insert into here and so that goes in there and then there's a bearing there so this rotates. Now why is this important? Because when, when you're working with something this thin and you're trying, <laughs> light, trying to turn it over here and you're using a big old live center, well this thing's meant for pounds of wood, right? So it takes a little bit of momentum to get it turning. Plus as this is sitting in here to make this cut, you have to leave this butt of wood on here, the whole process, and then come back and do the finial at the very end, which is kind of a pain. You'd like to do that first and work your way back and not have to worry about it. 
Well, that's where the rubber chucky comes in because you can actually insert that in there once you establish the tip and then continue turning. I thought it was a crock. The first time, that's when I made my broken one. The second one, I got the hang of it. It really works pretty cool. But the other issue is, is when you spin this up, this thing's big and heavy. If you have something really thin on there, this won't pick up speed as fast and snap. This is very lightweight, very little drag, and it won't snap when it starts spinning. So that's pretty cool. So anyway, let's get started on the end. The tool I'm using is going to be a very swept back 40 degree angle spindle gouge because it works best for me in this situation. Anyway, I'm just going to remove some of the bulk of wood. One thing to keep in mind too is right about here is where that point from the live center comes into the wood. So my finial tip is going to be this way of that. But we just need to get some of this out of the way. Now, while we still have the live center here, it is a very good sturdy hold. So I'm going to pull off some excess wood while I'm doing this. I don't want to get way back on it, but I'm going to get some of it out of the way. And you can see I'm just doing a planing cut. Not planing cut, it's just a push cut, sorry. <laughs> Terminology. <clears throat> anyway, but I'm using this almost like I'd use a roughing gouge. Other people have different techniques, but this is the one that's worked best for me. And you'll find the one you like best too, because people do pull cuts and all sorts of stuff. But anyway, now we're getting down to the diameter of what we want the tip to be. We're just going to make a really delicate little finial and see how thin we go on camera, right? <laughs> no edits, right. <laughs> so anyway, that's about the diameter I want on the tip of the finial. So will come down here and I'll start making it like so. I'm just doing a little curve. One thing that's extremely important when you're doing this is, well, several things. You want to leave the nicest tool finish you can. So you want to take delicate cuts as you go. The other thing is your tool rest height is extremely critical for how well you can make these cuts. A little bit too high, wrong. A little bit too low is wrong. They both lead to catches. Right now, this tool is angled barely down. As the diameter goes down, I have to raise the handle. Raising the handle then brings that tip to the middle of this where it could flip and snap. So you have to adjust your tool rest up and down to make sure you kind of keep an angle at all times on this. So out here, I'm fine. Here, I'm getting to a critical point where I might want to lower it. But anyway, let's move this back just a little bit more and sweep it. I'm not trying to make a straight line on this, not like a straight triangle. I'm trying to make a curve, right? So that's looking pretty good. I gotta kind of move a little bit of light in here, old eyes, something like, there we go, that helps me. Okay, black against a gray uh, lathe is not easy to see. So now I'm doing a slicing cut because I'm gonna establish that edge. And this is where, if you don't get this right, your finial is just gonna look dumb. So I'm using my fingers as a backstop as I make these cuts just in case it wants to kick back on me. And so I'm putting in the tool almost straight up and down just to take a delicate cut here. I don't want to take a chunk of wood. So they come down here. I'm going to start establishing the diameter of my uh, finial. I want to get about a quarter inch of this established before I put my rubber chucky on. But as always, with any turning, always use protection. <clears throat> How they came up with that name, I do not know. So uh, you can see I'm torching my edge there a little bit, but let's get this diameter down a bit. One thing when you're turning a normal finial and you're using a live center, you don't ever want to go back on the uh, finial itself and do any more cutting because it will snap. <laughs> we'll prove that wrong here in just a second. So anyway, whoops, that snapped off. So the first thing I want to do is just gently come in here and I'm going to clean this up. I want a really tight tip. And this is why that little tool rest pays off. I'm putting my finger up here just as a backstop. I'm not pushing real hard, but it's giving me enough support to come in here and make that delicate cut without vibrating the wood too much. There we go. That looks good. Now, let's go ahead and change out to the Chucky and I'll show you how that works real quick. Just gonna undo this, back it off. There's an ejector in here that pushes that out. And then we're going to take our Chucky and put it on here. I'll bring it up here. I'm going to push it down. I'm going to advance it in, and you can see how it's going to go right in that little hole. Now I'm going to turn the lathe on, and I'm going to watch this carefully. 
get a little more light over here. You might be able to see this. It looks a little bright. <laughs> okay, I see it's turning now. That's all the pressure I want to put on there. As long as that's turning, I'm good. So, I'm going to sharpen my tool, freshen up the edge, and we're going to come back and start attacking the rest of the finial. Okay, I've got my freshly sharpened tool here. And this is where, this is my style. I come in here and treat this just like I would a roughing gouge. I put my finger in there to pinch. I advance this till it's just touching and I do straight lines back and forth. And all I'm doing is barely advancing the tool each time. What this does is I don't change the up or down angle of my tool. I'm not turning it. So I really reduce the risk of getting a catch with something this thin and delicate. And I work in about inch increments and work my way back towards the headstock. You see how quickly this is coming off. And you can hear a little bit of vibration in there, but if you were doing this with a live center or no support, it would be chattering all over the place and you'd never get your cut. On that interesting one I made that you saw off the top of the show that has a bend in it, it was right here where I got my catch and it snapped and it stayed on the lathe and I glued it. thought, that'll work. Then when I turned it back on, you can see that it was out around a little bit. I thought, well, let's go ahead and finish it. Why not? Now I don't want to waste the wood. I shouldn't look up and talk at you while I'm doing this either. But look at this. This is something I never could have been able to do on another finial. Let's come back to here and actually cut and come back. That rubber chucky is doing a phenomenal job. I don't know the physics behind it, but it works really good. Now, this is a little bit like paint drying some... It's also talking. It's a little bit like watching paint dry, so I'm going to work my way on back, and then we'll put a little shape on the end on here and uh, talk about a little bit about aesthetics. Now we worked our way down to where we're almost to ready to put a base on here, but let's talk just a little bit about shape. As you're doing this, make this tiny. This can be smaller because it's in the shaft, but this should be a little bit larger than that. And then down here, this should flare out larger. There's a thirds rule and you can kind of go, that is one third the width of that. This is about two thirds the width of that. It's aesthetically pleasing. If you make everything the same shape, it won't look good, it won't taper, it won't be really cool. I had some glass, oh, there they are. Glasses around here somewhere. Anyway, as you can see, we're looking really thin here. So now it's time to decide where we're gonna put our shape, and you can see already I have an idea going right there. Heck, I'm cricket. So I wanna make sure I keep the tool riding on top. Still gonna go very carefully here. I just, this is amazing how this is working with that rubber chucky. I haven't had a new product like that in a long time that I thought was really cool and really worked. So anyway, let's just make a very careful shape here. I'm going to swing it in like so and taper that in. I like that. Now we're going to come out here on this width, getting a little bit of vibration, but I just need to back off on how hard I'm pushing the tool. So there. Now we have a nice foot. All we have to do is grab our little tiny parting tool and I'm just going to clean the edge up here like so. Then we'll come down here and I'm going to make this tenon about one quarter of an inch so when I drill a hole it will fit with a one quarter inch drill hole. But the important thing is is that I'm going to angle the tool in now and I'm going to undercut this base. And that again goes with everything. We'll put it on a rounded lid. So when I set it on the lid, boom, that's the edge it's going to touch. So let's see how we did here. Going to pull the rubber chucky back. If I unlock it, there we go. Look at that. And look how beautifully that's spinning. That's what I love about working with ebony. And that did a great job. Going to part this off. Normally you would sand it, but I'm just going to go ahead and part it off right now. And now we've done that. We're going to show you how to mount it in the lid, and then we're done with our finial. Okay, well, how are we going to drill this to where it's going to sit up straight? Well, the cool thing is, look at that. It sits in an angle, right? So we'll keep it at an angle. Just put a little pressure on here. The big thing is, don't drill through the lid. <laughs> That'd be bad. There we go. I think that's enough. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, let's take it over here. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> got it on the lens. But anyway, take our lid over here, put her on, be a nice tight fit. I can actually drill a hole just a tad deeper and get rid of that seam. 
But anyway, so that's how you make a finial lid. I think that's really kind of a cool way to accessorize this other project, having the um, wing bowl get a little added lid to it. And I'm gonna keep this one on here, change my mind, because I just like the funky look of it. Well, anyway, that's it. That's how you make a finial lid. Until the next time, keep turning.